Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Jeffrey Lyles welcoming you to the first installment of 2022 of Lyles Movie Files. Bro Shot, are you really excited and thrilled that I did not say 2021? Woo, woo, woo. And that was really something I was making sure I didn't slip up and go 2021 and we have to do the whole thing over again. Nobody would know, of course, but one take and done. Yes. Good job. So one other thing that's basically done, the same day in theaters, same day at home. I know. Movie theaters, movie studios are not really happy with that. They felt like they lost too much money. Warner Brothers like, nope, nope, champ. The only way you go to see the Batman is if you bring your tail to the theater. We don't care what COVID variant's going on. You've got to take a seat and get up and all up in that COVID. But according to this deadline report, Black Widow suffered a huge loss due to piracy. It was reported that it was maybe up to $600 million Disney lost out on due to piracy. I think that's interesting just in the sense that how much, how much do the theaters typically, the movies typically lose due to piracy? $600 million seems like a whole lot, especially for people being able to watch it at home anyway. Okay. That, that to some reason, that doesn't track. It tracks, you know how, like, when, pop, when theaters aren't populated, quote unquote, there's the thought that somebody's piracy got a cam, bootleg camera rig kind of getting movies but now that's not how movies are distributed it's much more digital kind of deal and because people did want to go see that movie but again how much was it disney's delay on trying to figure out an exact strategy on how to release that movie that actually allowed piracy to happen because i'm sure they probably released some copies to the nba when there was talk about them being able to see the film and probably one of those copies went missing and somebody downloaded it on a laptop and didn't say nothing or gave them back to this or the flash drive. And that's, I mean, a many of the popular things go on. I mean, and they just were smart enough not to release it until the actual movie was in theaters. But I think the other aspect, the other problem was people didn't want to go to theaters to see a movie that wasn't perfectly relevant so they were much more likely to pirate to pirate that one i'm sure shang chi did not suffer that much because people want like you know what y'all are doing it you guys told me when it's going to be there i'll go see it i feel a little more secure in what was that uh march of last year for black widow oh yeah like right when the pandemic hit yeah nobody was yeah that was theater in May to go see black widow yeah, it's like you you you're gonna like, hey, do you wanna see do you wanna risk your life to see a, a movie about a dead character? <laughs> would you nah. too like to be dead like Black Widow? Mm, it's like no. would you like to see the Soul Stone? No? Okay, well Maybe not. I'm not jumping. Yeah. I'm not gonna be the one jumping. Sorry, Cliff. Clint. Yeah, so you got this one. It's interesting. And this article also mentioned Warner Brothers dismal failure with Wonder Woman nineteen eighty four. And I still very much strongly contend that Wonder Woman 1984 was a terrible movie. And it was probably better for them to have people watch the movie than to just keep pushing it back till now. Because if their thought was Wonder Woman 1984 was going to have a Spider-Man No Way From Home or No Way Home kind of blockbuster performance, that is not happening. I think it may have been somewhere along the lines of Shang-Chi, Eternals. Tracking in that 60 to $80 million opening at best. And then when the word of mouth got out, this is not worth it. It would have basically capped out around 150, 175. Honestly, like, see, cause I'm, I'm going to go with like, it would have probably, they would have probably had to release it after black widow. Like I'm trying to kind of coming up like when people thought we were going to be able to get out and, you know, do a, our normal life is going to start resuming. I think that was the time, but they couldn't have picked that day. Like, okay, here's everything. Like, remember, Fast and the Furious is a billion dollar franchise, and it did not do anywhere near its new, usual numbers. Yeah, and it did not have a 
same day same same day theater same day streaming release it had 45 right. days and typically that's 120 150 million opening this one didn't crack 100 million and it's like yeah that's that's great for the pandemic now it's this this fuzzy haze of oh people came to see spider-man so look at how much money the theaters would have missed the movie studios missed out for not putting these movies out with the streaming well, option yeah. it. at that point at that point it was a culmination of pandemic fatigue people th- on some some regard then there's other hey i'm good i'm vaccinated which it, that always has to be the asterisk like hey everything out ap- before and after has to be considered it's like you didn't lose money before because there was no even though i wanted to see wonder woman there was no way in heck i was going to go see that in theaters and then if some i would have trusted someone's review that this movie is horrible far more if i before vaccinations because i wouldn't i'm not i wouldn't jumped out there like oh it's okay okay is not going to get me to the movie theater it has to be it has to be no way home level to get me out of yeah. it i mean yeah. even then we're still like pre-vaccinations i still be like mm, i don't know about that one yeah but you told me that movie is just okay a five out of five out of ten six out of ten or it's actual rating of one out of ten like i wouldn't i wouldn't touch that movie like no yeah i think we're gonna see a lot of studios surprised that their event films like the second avatar don't do no way home numbers and it's gonna be this whole well it must be the pandemic i mean there have been a ton of movies like west side story steven spielberg's remake critics loved it audiences didn't go anywhere near it came out the same time as spider-man no way home and the reason no one went to see it was because it's a pandemic and if i'm going to get this covid variant i'm going to get to watch no way home not west side story yes i mean because you're i mean the, the actual funny thing is the people probably in west side story are probably the people you could probably hang out a little bit because they're all you know vaccinated boosted you know having triple masks on to go see the movie no way home you just i mean you you hey <laughs> oh snake eyes yeah um, but there were if you you gave me that choice too i still been like no nah, i'll catch it on uh blu-ray you know if it's a great movie hey i'll watch it but i'm not going to sit in the movie theater for two hours with a mask on for a movie i'm really not in love with going to see again yeah i think they <laughs> i think they're trying to color it a rosy picture that every everybody missed out on so much money because they didn't put it out because of this theatrical window i think those studios and warner brothers were doing the responsible thing of do we really need to have people dying on our watch just to see a movie and i think not so well again this is always going to be his the next thing is you're going to they got let's say this if they didn't have the the movie theaters basically providing them cover i don't know if somebody wouldn't have tried to find some shady lawyer who would have found some loophole an assumption of risk and then been like you know what you guys created an unreasonable expectation of, you know me catching this virus by me paying this money and didn't do enough to protect me from this variant of covid by having all these people in here so i'm suing warner brothers i'm suing amc I'm sorry, you know, I'm everybody. I'm, I'm suing everybody. Like Regal, United Artists, any movie theater, and you, Warner Brothers, the distributor, the producers. I'm going to get all of you guys in some I'm random you, suit. Keanu. Yeah, it's like, so for them trying to like, oh, well, we you, you made the right call. And most of the movies you actually stop people from going to see were not movies that were going to make this giant amount of money. Because as much as... We like Tenet. I wouldn't have gone to see that movie in the theater. Nope. But again, most of, most of Chris, Chris Nolan's movies, as good as they are, do not make this ginormous billion dollars in movie theaters. It's not the Batman franchise. It's more, oh, this made a good amount of money. But it's not going to... It's not keeping Blockbuster. It's not the return of the Blockbusters, which they were trying to bring. It's like, Christopher Nolan doesn't know Blockbusters. It's like, we make good psychological movies. Like, Memento, uh, you know, that's what you mean. Inception, like, that's what you're in for. Good movies like that. You want to be, if the next jerk beside you is talking, you're going to throw something at him because you're like, I'm trying to watch the dang movie. Like, yeah. So I think this is really interesting. And also interesting is Sony. 
which put out No Way Home, still wants zero part of pandemic trouble. So they have now pushed back Morbius for a fifth time. This movie was originally supposed to come out back in July 20th, 2020. Now, it is coming out April 2022. And I don't see anything wrong with that because this isn't doing No Way Home numbers. And No Way Home is such an anomaly because it is one of the top 10 highest grossing films, period. Those don't come around every week. And I know we've kind of gotten spoiled with the Marvel Cinematic Universe cranking out a new one with Black Panther, Avengers Infinity War, Avengers Endgame. That we kind of felt like, well, this is just the norm. A new Marvel movies every year is going to be on that top 10, top 20 all-time highest grossing list. Morbius is not the case. And I think they're doing a smart thing, settling it down, waiting for the variant, hopefully to die out some, and then maybe throw this movie out. I think April's a good time for a movie like Morbius, where there's not a lot of competition. We haven't cranked into summer blockbuster season. People may be interested in checking it out then. What's your thoughts on it? I mean... They, Sony also read, the, you know, they saw the tea leaves. They had Venom out last year, and they saw what D- Venom's numbers were, and it was like, yeah, if we're gonna recoup money on this non-Spider-Man franchise and actually give it some legs, we have to get it where it makes money. We can't act like, oh, we can't keep, oh, it's okay, it was during the pandemic. It's like, no, we gotta release this when it actually is gonna make money, and. Can we read the tea leaves and say April's going to be perfect? No, but at least give it a chance. Like, all right, if we if April, you know, people do do what they should do. Hopefully, we'll be done with it. I mean, if I mean, it's like that's the best we can do. It's like if you're you're trying to make money for your company, you're like, this is not the time, and we're going to lose money. It looked like it is because nobody's cr- screaming to go see. Mobius. It's just not happening. Like, at least Venom was a sequel that we could say, oh, well, it probably will have a little more legs. This is a whole new thing that may or, if it's not really good and gets great word of mouth, it's done after the first week. I don't think there's going to be a huge demand for Morbius. I think Jared Leto's going to overact like crazy. And anyway, so that's that. We'll see what happens on that front. Director Chloe Zhao is being a really good sport about the box office take for the Eternals. Uh, She put out to her followers on Instagram, I believe. And um, basically the question was posted, posed via Rotten Tomatoes. Does Chloe Zhao's superhero epic Eternals really deserve to be ranked at the bottom of the MCU? And she put a little screen cap and then wrote a little something does it question mark smiley face join on the fun debate or join the fun debate or if you are not sure check it out on disney plus on january 12th with director's commentary and many features i love that she's being a good sport about it you know something has to be at the bottom of the mcu and that's not necessarily a bad thing because mcu's just been great and instead of being all like Patty Jenkins and being, well, the movie was bad because the reception for it was bad because it came out on HBO Max. No, 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 Patty. The movie was bad. Full stop. The movie was bad. And Eternals, honestly, was way better than Wonder Woman. I mean, it had something going, at least. The plot made sense. Nobody did a male male hijack a body, not using permission, whatever you want to use on that deal. It was just... A little disjointed and i feel like it really would have been better if she had just had access to do a disney plus series on eternals it felt like it needed more time but that was the only thing so i really like her eh, who cares you know whatever i made a lot of money directing this joint and you guys can figure it out you know what i mean like to be honest if please be honest that was one movie i would almost want to hear your comment like kind of your thought process as a director, like there was, I mean, my, I mean, when we were talking on the show, I had my critiques on the movie and why it did not work. But I would like, I mean, like when it's on Disney Plus, it's like if you give me an option, like to hear what the director was thinking, like I'll check it out and then I can debate and say, hey, you know, here's what she said, here's why I think, you know, a lively debate. Like, but going back to Wonder Woman, a eighty four, it's like I don't have to debate you. That's just bad. And you can't tell me you thought that was good. Like, 
No, you said like when you when you had maybe one too many sips of wine, you actually admitted you thought the movie was trash. Like so, don't try and act like you didn't say the movie was trash because it was trash. Um, this one, I mean, like, yeah, I, I, I mean, like, I'll, I mean, again, when when I went to was on Disney Plus and I was like, oh, Eternals. Oh, next week. Okay, I mean, I, I mean, I'll check it out again. Maybe I'll see something that like it wasn't that bad. But I feel like it's too long for a movie. But I'm like you. This might be one of those rare cases where the director's commentary would offer some insight, at least in terms of the thought process and kind of okay. I get where she was going. I don't like it, but I understand. Maybe it's just better as like a three and a half hour movie, and that's and it got cut down to you know whatever. I couldn't do. I couldn't. I couldn't do another five. (laughs) <laughs> it's at the bottom of my rank is for a reason so i say yes it absolutely deserves to knock out iron man 3 but um her director's commentary could be very interesting so next up michael keaton had some interesting comments as to why he did not show up for batman forever and he did an interview with the backstage podcast talking about why he did not team up with joel schumacher to do batman forever <laughs> And Keaton said the role was always Batman and was always Bruce Wayne and never Batman. With the director who directed the third one, I said, I just can't do it. And one of the reasons I couldn't do it was, you know, he's a nice enough man. He's passed away, so I wouldn't speak ill of him, even if he were alive. He at one point, after more than a couple meetings, where I kept trying to rationalize doing it, hopefully talking him into saying, I think we don't need to go in this direction. I think we should go in this direction. And he wasn't going to budge. But I remember one of the things that I walked away going, oh, boy, I can't do this. He asked me, I don't understand why everything has to be so dark and everything so sad. And I went, wait a minute. Do you know how this guy got to be Batman? Have you read? I mean, it's pretty simple. And it's pretty simple. And that explains in a nutshell why Michael Keaton decided, thanks, I'm good. I will wait until fan interest soars once again. And I can resume the role of Batman in 2022. Kind of mind blowing when you think about it like that. But yeah, Joel Schumacher didn't get Batman. Shocker, but <laughs> that's straight from Michael. You watch Batman forever. <laughs> that may have been the all time best. Just candid reaction. To anything? Hey, Canada, why didn't you do Speed Two? <laughs> Did you see Speed Two? <laughs> there you go. But yeah. That's interesting. I mean that I mean funny thing, I mean that's actually true. I mean it's like if yeah, that's how you were going, it's like you can't go I mean maybe Schumacher was more a fan of the Adam West kind of Batmans. And do not like I, I watched it on reruns. I enjoyed the heck out of it. But they had already established that was Batman and then trying to go a different direction. That, with, especially with Michael Keaton, would have been so jarring. It would have been like, you know, what's oh, funny? God. What's really funny about this is Michael Keaton would have given Batman Forever so much credibility that even though it wasn't a good movie, having him do, like, if they just literally didn't change word one in the dialogue and just popped him back in instead of Al Kilmer... That movie would be better because we'd have in our heads, this is Batman. What was really jarring was having another Batman and Val Kilmer was just like, yo, oh, I'm sorry. I was sleeping over here. And <laughs> and Jim Carrey just being Jim Carrey through the whole joint. And then Tommy Lee Jones, not quite sure how to play Two-Face, very much like an Adam West style Batman character. And but yeah, I think Michael Keaton would have given this movie so much more credibility than it deserved. And it's really commendable that he decided, nope, I'm not sticking around for this movie. I think the best you know, part about Batman Forever is Wu-Tang Clan's Thriller. It, it's funny because I'm like in my head, I'm like, with him sticking around, I mean, Michael Keaton sticking around, been similar to how Superman 3 was. And hey, I watched Superman 3, and I think that's kind of very much where it would have been like, if there had been a second, a second Superman, we'd have been like, oh, no, I'm not touching this Superman 3 crap. 
Oh uh, yeah. Oh, Richard Pryor's in it. Is he? Is he? Is it R-rated? No, then pass. Like, hard pass. It's, uh, yeah. So hard, so, hard pass. Yeah, like that was not. I mean that. But he, Christopher Reeves gave that movie way more credibility. And I think. I mean, you think about it like Michael Keaton's stoic, but con- I mean, like entertaining uh, uh, Bruce Wayne, and then sitting around watching you know Jim Carrey act like a moron, and that was the role he was given. I'm not Bruce talking Jim about Carrey. He was. They wrote it with Jim Carrey in mind, doing Fire Marshal Bill, Fire Marshal Bob, Bob, right? Bill. Bill. Bob. Gosh, it's been too long. It's so dumb. I actually watch Living Color. It's so, been yeah. It. Yeah, we'll have to put that in the but, comments later. Yeah, that that there was no way he would. I mean, you just saw probably the blank stare him like, "How much is this paycheck?" Yeah, I'm still out. Bye. Yeah. So good call, Michael Keaton. You made the right choice. Warner Brothers, however, <laughs> may not be making the right choice. I know that shocking <laughs> and so unbelievable. But the latest rumor now is that this Flash movie is going to wipe out the Snyderverse. We're going to uh, basically dismiss everything associated with Zack Snyder's. So Man is still Batman versus Superman in Justice League. And uh, they're going to replace Superman with uh, Supergirl. Michael Keaton's Batman is going to replace Ben Affleck's Batman. The Justice League will now be comprised of Flash, Supergirl, Michael Keaton, Batman, Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman, Jason Momoa's Aquaman, and Zachary Levi's Shazam. Oh, I'm sorry. And and Leslie Grace's Batgirl. Sorry, I forgot her. Wait, why is Batgirl in the Justice League? I, just, I don't really understand these things. I think, well, Michael Keaton's going to show up in a Batgirl movie. So we know this. So maybe it's going to be a passing of the torch where Batgirl's the Justice League Bat family member. And Michael Keaton's kind of back in a Alfred's style role of sitting behind in the Batcave advising. Right. So he's going to be the guy in, guy in the chair? He's going to be the guy in the chair, but probably not as funny as Ned. <sighs> How excited are you for this Flash movie? It's going to wipe away mm, Cyborg, our best Batman, and the best Superman since Christopher Reeve. Sadly, it's expected, and that's why it's like, yeah, this is gonna wipe it out. But how long is this whole DC universe gonna exist? I mean, that's the sad thing. It's like Marvel is on year twenty of continuity and all the goodwill not year, possible. Not year twenty, right? It's just ten years they did. No, two thousand eight yeah. okay. was when Iron Man showed up. Oh wow! So we're year thirteen on that. And they have movies for the next five years, and we still haven't even got Fantastic Four or X Men. Or X Men. Those are two really and, big aces up the sleeve to, to pull out later. Yeah, it's like when you, when when your fifth round pick is <laughs> Joe Montana, you're okay. Um, <laughs> it's like like that's basically how you know Marvel's hidden. DC. It's. I mean, it's. It's. It's going to come down to like somebody's who, whoever's in charge of the films, is going to be like, I'm out. I can't do this. And they desperately, desperately need a Kevin Feige who can say, we need a reset. And honestly, the reset would be best served with a Flashpoint event. But they don't look like they're taking the proper steps in this reset. It's. I'm already concerned about where they're trying to go with it. There is a space for a Superman that's hopeful and smiling and being the beacon of optimism and everything that you need, right? The symbol, it's not an S, it uh, stands for hope. I don't know if they understand how to do that. And throwing in Supergirl isn't going to do that. And also Supergirl is a brunette. So this hatred of DC Warner Brothers for... The characters who are blonde in, in these comic books and making them brunette continues unabated. I'm, I, okay, listen. I mean, like, there's other. I mean, like, there's sadly other elephants in the room. It's like with DC, it's like you're you're wiping away kind of the male kind of dominated version of DC, and then you're putting in females 
the female roles. And it's like, guys, like, these are, if you're trying to do something different, it's like, you, you got to do stick the landing on the first stuff, and then you can expand and do everything else. And that, everybody will applaud you. But you guys haven't done anything right. And then it's going to be like, I don't want to see Supergirl getting... Because, I mean, like, she's... I mean, I've watched her on Young and the Restless. Like, she's, you know, doesn't seem like a bad person. But you're going to have... a bad person? I, huh? I'm not a bad actress. No, nah, I mean, like, I, I mean, I don't see... I mean, I can look on her Instagram. She's messed with her cat or something. She's, you know, not not kicking down pigeons. You know, whatever. So she's not Mel Gibson. Right. Basically. That's, you know, that's my threshold, you know. Not, not on social media like that. But you are going to put her... And probably the new bad girl, you're gonna probably gonna put them almost in, in jeopardy having the Kelly uh, Kelly Marie Tran like her social media instead of it being a positive you know good thing. It's like y'all are just gonna like the floodgates of just a holes are gonna be unleashed on them, and it's like you've already seen you guys don't do a good job of protecting people with Ray Fisher, and you're gonna do that like hey, there's a loyal fan base. Of the Snyderverse, and you are going to wipe that out. I, I mean, I, I hate. I mean, that's that's what I hate. It's like because I don't think. I think an expansive role would have been awesome. A good Justice League with everything, but you guys, just like hey, that thing that you guys keep tweeting at us to love, and we told you and you was never going to happen, and then you did, and then you proved that it should have kept happening. We're going to also say, hey, you know. Use whatever words you want to use. No. And then we're going to do something completely different. Good luck to, you know, who our actors, who are, I mean, our actors, actresses, who are just going to be left out in the lurch, and you're going to have Ezra Miller trying to defend you. I feel this would be, like, after No Way Home, them going, good news, we're replacing Spider-Man with Miles Morales, who got this this kid who's really great and we're really looking forward to it and people are like dude we still have so much more left of, of tom holland's peter parker's story what are you doing but marvel's not stupid they're like mm, why would we do that we can introduce miles later and i would be on board for a world's finest movie with supergirl and batgirl i think that could be fine but i want the justice league versus the injustice league I want to see them take on Darkseid. And I don't understand if you've introduced the concept of the multiverse, why it needs to be this or that. Why you can't just do the Henry Cavill, Ben Affleck, Justice League, taking on Darkseid, you know, one or two movies, whatever. Doing that. The fans say they want it and they haven't shut up about it for good or bad. And you guys are just going... No, it's okay, honest. We we know what we're doing, but it doesn't seem like they know what they're doing. They've never shown that. And it's hard to trust. Like if Marvel said we're gonna do something crazy and wild, we'll go, okay, well what is it? We're not gonna tell you. All right, we trust you. You just knocked out no way home. You we'll, you we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you the Eternals we know nothing about. We're barely their trailers. <laughs> and yes, we will go see this movie. Nothing no, but you guys who who have had a track record of hey, you had Zack Snyder's um, just uh, Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice. We saw what you put out, and then we saw on the Blu-ray what this movie should have been. And you're like, we don't trust you guys. It's like you already got a bad track. And then we see the actual what should have been a two-part movie, what that movie would have been. And would have set you guys all up for everything. You could have had Shazam. You could have had Wonder Woman. You could have had everything. You saw what you did to that. And you blew it. I mean, it, I mean, it was bad. Like you know, ten days old tacos, bad. And that's what that's you did. And you now want us? Hey, you know, we're going to do something else radically different. And you want to go with this? Like. No, I mean, like, we've already seen what you, you have planned on the Batman. We've seen, I mean, like, we don't have, I mean, like, we lost we lost faith in you to jump up there with the Batman. Like, then you say, hey, there's going to be another Wonder Woman. I don't care. I'm I'm not going to see it. Like, I'll be on Blu-ray day. I'm not watching that movie. Um, And then you're saying, like, all these other hurdles. It's like, oh, that thing that we actually did that should have been okay if we had just left our fingerprints off it and not cut a 
two and a half hour, I mean, a three hour movie down to 2.15 because, you know, who needs a story? We're going to give you a whole new wipe everything out and hope you like it. And we're not going to have a black dude in this joint. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. I mean, I don't understand why they're still so hesitant to do anything of significance with Green Lantern. I know they've got the HBO Max show coming at some point, uh, maybe. But why is Jon Stewart not on this revised, revamped, better than ever Justice League? It just seems like that is a clear and obvious missing element. Having a black dude or just a black woman. I know Leslie Grace is black and Latina. Latinx so we have that somewhat covered but I mean we don't have to worry about that with Gal Gadot and I mean with Gal Gadot I guess there's still not a bunch of white people running around in these series outside of Michael Keaton and Ezra mm-hmm. Miller but I still want to see more I want to see a black person in this joint and I feel like if we're we're trumpeting diversity where is the black hero and it could be anybody it could be Steel it could be a better take on cyborg with a better looking outfit that didn't look like it was rigged up together in CG Island or geez, wait, who's another prominent black hero, uh, 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 black lightning. Oh, that's right. We've just had him on a TV show. So there's again, it's, it's, it's like if you, at this point I have given up on film version of DC. I am much more going to stick with the, Superman and Lois Next version week. of like that's it. I can't, I can't, I can't mess with DC in film. Well, I mean, it's, I don't think they've done anything to warrant any goodwill. Hopefully, Naomi is as good as Superman and Lois and Star Girl, so we have another CW show to be excited about. Um, I'm hoping it's very little in common with Brian Michael Bendis's take on the character in Justice League, where he writes her like an idiot. But we'll which, see. Which, who, who's going to be running like Eddie? Brian Michael Bendis writes Naomi. He co-created her with David F. Walker. Um, oh, Naomi. Yeah. So Bendis, Bendis tries. I mean, I will always defend him in that front. He made sure that Miles Morales was a prominent character. He really raised the status of Luke Cage, really helped elevate him to getting a show on Netflix, basically. And um, has really been about diversity. And not just the dude who's talking about it. Oh, it's really important, but I don't know how to write black characters. That's never been my beef with him. I appreciate everything he's done on that front because he's not just talking about it. But his writing has suffered dramatically over the last few years. Basically, since he left uh, Daredevil and his interesting and pretty decent run on Avengers slash Dark Avengers then he went to Guardians of the Galaxy right when the movie hit. And it was like, eh, that's, that's crummy. Because the Guardians of the Galaxy before him was great. Anyway, we're not talking about him. Now it's on to uh, Boba Fett. The Book of Boba Fett. Second episode dropped today. Um, I really like the show. I think they're doing an amazing job with it. I am really invested. I am not quite sure if this show is really best suited for a week-to-week release setup. Because I'm looking forward to the next episode, but I don't feel like enough happens on each episode where I feel like I'm missing, you know, there's nothing crazy that shows up and happens. And it's like, oh, shoot, it got spoiled and ruined for me. What do you think of this episode? You know how, like, Hawkeye, you once each episode was over, there was something lingering that you're like, oh, what's going to happen again? What's going to happen next? Oh, I see kind of where this story is going to go. I think I see something, and I'm intrigued to see where it goes. This one is, Boba Fett is a crime lord, starting out crime lord, and that's it. It's no, they're really, I mean, it's, it's like, if I miss next week, I'm not sure I'm like, oh gosh, I really got to go back and see it. It's like, oh, I can probably, the, at the pace they're going right now, I can catch up in three to four more weeks. And be like, oh, okay, oh, this was what happened. But weekly, it's it. If I just get slightly distracted and forget a new episodes on, I'm not gonna be back. Like, I mean, like how Young Justice right now is. It almost I need to watch it in binge form to get a storyline. This is more. This seems like um, uh, Book of Boba Fett almost seems like it's a storyline 
at series, you don't have to come back every week and try and catch it. I think one problem with the show is the storytelling format because in just the first two episodes, they started off with the current present day events and then they go to extended flashbacks. I think that slows the momentum down because it's like, okay, well, here's what happened to him on this path. But the modern present day story is what is immediate, what's going on. And we wrap that in the first 15, 20 minutes of an episode, then it's to long flashback. I think maybe if they just flip that where Boba Fett, we see him in the past and then we go to the present day, it would be more effective because I think this present day to pass credits is slowing down the momentum and making it so, okay, I don't need to tune in right away because I know at the end of this flashback, which is the end of the episode, he's going to be okay. There's no cliffhanger from that. Because, like, you know, you think of, like, I, I, just, I, like, just because I just seen this uh, Luke Cage season one, where we get a whole first episode's Luke Cage doing present day Luke Cage thing. The second one is basically two minutes of present day, and then it's the whole episode's the flashback of how he got to be Luke Cage. This season, I mean, this show right now is like. Give me two episodes of the flashback because right, it, it's the present day is suffering too much. It's like, what is the what's the end game for Boba Fett? Him to be the boss of Tatooine, like the boss of all bosses. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't. It's, it's, it's funny. I'm not saying this is a this show is a miss because you know small screen Disney has done very well. Yeah, but they've got to give me a hook on. A bad guy, a good guy, a cameo, something that's like, oh, this is the episode I really want to watch. Like, you saw last season when it said Ahsoka. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, I need something like, uh, you're going to see Ahsoka or Luke or somebody, Han, which we know is, that's just not going to happen. But we need, I need something to say, all right, this is the episode I definitely want to catch. I'll catch up all the seasons. All the episodes and get there, but right now it's if you catch it cool. If 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 not, you're not. Yeah, I don't think you're missing anything. Right now. now they did have a very cool reveal, and I'm not sure if you or people who haven't been reading the comic books would care so much about this. But that Wookie character is a very cool character in the comic books, and he um, is a bounty hunter employed by Darth Vader. He sends him off to track down Luke Skywalker. And the comic is set basically right after Star Wars, A New Hope. And he's like, yo, find this, this kid who blew up the Death Star. And he's one of the bounty hunters that he sends out early. And in a flashback chapter of Obi-Wan, he also encounters this guy. So he's really like dangerous and they made him look cool. And it was really exciting to me because I was like, oh, shoot, he's coming into the show. But I feel like for people who don't read the comic book, that's not that exciting cameo. But I was like, I want to see what else happens with these Jabba, the Hutt twins, cousins. I was really excited about the first half. And I just want more. I don't dislike what we're seeing in the flashbacks. I just feel like we need to balance it out so it's more of a 50-50 or 70-30 split of the present to flashback. That was something that Lost juggled really well. Like, it never felt like the flashbacks overtook what was going on on the island or the flash forwards. And I feel like right now the balance is skewing a little bit too far to the um, pres the past. Well, well like, let me say this. Like, the guys on the train, if I'm not mistaken, based on the comic a cartoon, Phone those are, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I think they're very, I think they're part of Black Sun. But it's like, you got to kind of, like, drop Maul's name. Like, do something. Like, hey, you know, I, I don't know. Wait, Maul's dead at this point. Um, yeah. Right. Wait. But. Wait. Yeah. Yeah. He's on dead Maul is right. dead yet. <laughs> it's like, Kenobi, Kenobi kills him before. Um, yeah, he it's kills him. Pike while Luke. That's who those guys are. The Pike Syndicate. Yeah, but they work. I mean, in, in one, I mean in, during the Clone Wars, they work for Maul, but it's. Now it's like, oh, okay. We don't even, we can't even bring that in. So it's like, give me my hook or I can pass on this one for a little bit. Okay. 
Well, what is one thing that you absolutely cannot pass on is your nominee for Dummy of the Week. So, bro shot, <laughs> yours is Married at First Sight. Tell me why, please. My, well, as we, you know, last season, we were all invested because of its A comedy and we were rooting for those swell kids, Johnny and Bao, and we were just going to watch the train wreck of how everybody else was, but it was going to be entertaining and, you know, it was just good work. And then you get hope for Jose and Rachel, like, oh, wow, you guys, I just didn't see that. And then after our reunion, hey, Jose, Rachel, how you doing? Yeah, we split up. Jesus. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, we're, but we're working on it. Oh, okay. Hey, uh, Gil and Merle, how y'all doing? Man, two weeks after film, we just called it. What? She called it. What I had it? no idea what was going on. I, I got blindsided. All this stuff. She said she loved me on the show. You know, man, she just said the camera's on. She hated me. Right. I'm in therapy, man. Dang. But the good news is Zach and Bao made a love connection. With other people. Sorry. But then Zach yeah. started having relationships with other people. <sighs> just a mess. It's so almost like, again, that see, it's like, as we all do with the couple's camera, couple's cam, you know, for the uh, Jamie and, and uh, Ambers of the world, where we thought they had no chance in Hades, and they're like, we're the happiest couple in the world. Jamie and Beth. No, no, no. I, I meant, like, uh, Jamie and Amber from, like, previous seasons, the one they were screaming at each other half the way through the show. Jamie and Beth. Yeah. Her name's Beth? Oh, oops. My bad. But they're the, ah, this can all work, you know, opposite to drag. And the last season was like, we bring an older crowd thinking they got this crap together and they got all their stuff together, just not with any other human being. Uh, for us to want to jump back on the barrier to first sight train that's on tonight, you're like, I kind of got burned, man. Y'all at least need to have a 20% ratio of one of these couples living. Like, y'all can't even make it six months after the last one. Like, you want me to sit through two-hour episodes of these people trying to find each other, and then it's a, yeah. So they just basically dated for six months and then called it quits. So maybe, maybe our experts aren't so good at this game anymore. For I me, like, you can under watch it. Mm. Yeah, I think their problem is, and I, I told you this before we started recording, they were having pie in the sky. Well... She said she doesn't want to be with somebody who smokes. This guy chain smokes. But if they can somehow work around that, I think they're going to be great for each other. And it's like, oh, yeah. Well, he is a super conservative. And her sister is now a dude. And I think that's going to work out if he can overlook that one little thing. And it was like, dude, be realistic. Just say, what? hey. He's, he's a WFT fan, and she's a Cowboy fan. Maybe if they can have fun watching football together, they can work out. That's small. They were going for yeah. major stuff. No, I mean, like, because it's like, hey, Johnny and Bauer are both control freaks, admittedly. So we're going to put them together and see how that works out. Like, so neither one is going to give and take. So, yeah, put them together. See how that well that works. Um, Spoiler, it did. But, like uh, Brett and Ryan. Hey, he may be a little more, you know, conservative. She may be, you know, super liberal. But I'm sure people who've never met are going to just be okay with that difference. Well, Merla, you know, should be probably be on our show, Unmatchable. But we're going to put her actually on the show with somebody at least, you know, seems decent enough. Let's, yeah, he'll be nice and patient. And then she's still going to be like, you didn't make every one of these boxes, you know, my high-flying lifestyle. Uh, I'll play nice for the cameras, and as soon as they're off, peace out, hombre. Yeah. Like, yeah, for you, you, you thinking I'm probably, I'm, I'm probably going to wait till I hear about the comedy on this season of um, Merity Fight site before I jump back on it. So. Jump back in. But one thing while you're waiting, and this is why you, my dear brother, are my dummy of the week, is because you have not started watching Cobra Kai. This is a criminal offense at this point. Now, this show is one of the, if not the absolute best, c continuations of a film series into a TV series. They have done an excellent job. I mean, you know how much we trash the Star, Star Wars sequel trilogy for just pissing all over all the goodwill of everything that ha 
existed before it. Cobra Kai is the exact opposite. They are literally having a right balance of, hey, let's pay homage to what happened before. I mean, they reference every character from the first three films. And, and the way they do it doesn't feel like, oh, let's throw them in there. Like there's a reason behind it. It's like, oh, shoot, they brought so-and-so back. Oh, that's so great. And this season, they brought back the psycho from Karate Kid 3. And it's just like, oh, man. And it's just, they keep defying my expectations with every episode where I think, oh, I know how this is going to go. Nope, you don't know how it's going to go. And they don't care about sticking to the black and white of characters. The bad guys don't always do bad things. Sometimes they're the victims. And then when they lash out, it's like, well, you had that coming, good guy. Sometimes good guys do cruddy stuff. And then it's like, yeah, you did deserve that. And they continue to flip that dynamic from season to season, where some of the really good characters are like super Sith-like characters now. And I feel like they have done, like they kind of reference Star Wars, but I feel like the writers really understand how to do a Star Wars type story where it's everything that's going on in the future has been influenced by the past. And so Daniel and Johnny are here, Kreese is here, and it's just like, dude, you guys didn't understand how to do this. You know how we're always complaining about how in Arrow, every woman is the best fighter ever? Felicity can do no wrong. The two main um, younger women in this show I want to put them into my Ripley, uh, the bride list of all time great action characters because they're so nuanced. They're not just perfect at everything. They mess up, they lose, they get humiliated, they look bad. And it's like you are invested in their growth, their evolution as characters. And I'm just cannot wait till season five this this cliffhanger was like oh my goodness i just need you to start watching because i i feel like as soon as you just get into like four episodes you're gonna be like hey guess what uh i didn't watch it i was a dummy of the week last week but now i'm done <laughs> caught up in hey, season five. We'll, 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 hey uh, you know i think this week is looking pretty empty so I'm, i might start on that tomorrow please do i mean it, it's, it's still relatively early tonight not, not judging, but you know. All right. Well, bro <laughs> shot, take that very stern warning under consideration. And thank you as mm-hmm. always for rolling with me. Thank y'all out there for listening and watching. This episode allows movie files has been filed. <laughs>